Hi friends, welcome back to my Pottery at Home series. This is a series where I answer some of your most frequently asked questions and give you all the information that you need to know about doing pottery at home. Today we're going to be talking about glaze firing. So I've got my pots bisked, sanded, and glazed, and I already have videos on these topics, so if you're interested in those, I'll definitely link them down below. So let's get to the actual firing. My last two videos were also all about firing, and if you haven't watched them yet, I highly recommend that you watch them before you watch this video. The first video was all about installing a kiln, everything that you need to know about preparing your house, safety tips, and just everything that you need to know before you purchase a kiln. And then my last video was all about the bisque firing, the first firing that you do. And in that video, I covered everything about the firing curve and how to program your kiln. So I'm not going to bore you all by repeating that information in this video. But the information in there about vitrification and ramps is definitely going to be helpful for you to understand glaze firing as well. So assuming you've already watched those videos, let's get into the specifics of the glaze firing. It's kind of an awkward angle. <laughs> Okay, so let me show you my firing program. So I will remind you that I'm using stoneware and especially during this final fire, the temperature matters a lot. <laughs> different clays will fire at vastly different temperatures and I highly recommend that you read your clay bag and figure out what temperature you should be using to avoid any kiln firing disasters. So here's the program that I use for my stoneware. Okay, so we are starting what I like to call zero, but it's actually room temperature. And the first ram is going to be 160 degrees per hour until it gets to 500 degrees. So you'll notice this is a little bit faster than the bisque fire. You can put a little bit more pressure on your pots during this stage. And then the next ramp is going to be a skip which means it's going to go full on into its final temperature, which for me, that is 1240 degrees. So when you choose a skip, that basically means that the kiln is gonna go as fast as it can to increase that temperature and get up to its final temperature. So your elements are gonna be running at full blast. With the clays and glazes that I'm using, there's absolutely no reason to want to control that. But of course, this is dependent on the clays and glazes that you use. So maybe you want to program a slower ramp in this second ramp. So I use 1240 as my final temperature. That doesn't actually mean that it's going to be 1240 in the kiln, however, because the heat actually varies in the kiln. This 1240 number is just the number that is being read by your thermocouple, and it's not actually the heat's effect that it has on your pottery. And that's why you want to use something like a cone, or I use these rings, and this basically measures the amount of heat work that the heat does to your pottery. So this is actually a slightly different metric than the actual temperature. It's actually how the temperature is absorbed and affects the materials that are in the kiln. So this is actually way more accurate than something like your thermocouple temperature reader. Like in my kiln, for example, at the bottom, it actually does end up being that 1240 when I measure it with these rings. However, at the top, and this is because heat rises, it's actually up to 1260. So in my previous studio, I had a much bigger kiln and I actually fired the same clays and the same glazes at 1250. But in this little kiln for who knows what reason is actually getting hotter towards the top, which ended up affecting my glazes quite a lot. I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. So because I used these rings, I was able to see, oh, this is actually slightly over firing. So instead of the programmed 1250, it was actually going to 1270. So what I did instead was I reduced the temperature from 1250 to 1240. And that means that although it was still slightly over firing than this 1240, the maximum temperature that the kiln reached was 1260, which was tolerable for my glazes. I hope that that makes sense. The moral is you may want to play around with this final temperature a little bit. Okay, and then once we get to 1240, the kiln will go into its third segment, which is 20 minutes. Just like with the bisque, it's gonna hold it for 20 minutes. So this metric is the one that I play around with the most when I'm having issues with my glaze this metric and also the final firing temperature, because I think that this has a pretty large impact on the way that the glazes develop, how long they are subjected to this intense heat. 
So if you're having issues with your glazes, you may want to play a little bit around with this length of time, but yeah, I use 20 minutes and I have for quite a while. And then cool down is again, just a skip. So as I mentioned in the bisque video, most glazes don't require a controlled cool down. There are some reasons that you may want to control your cool down in the final fire for things like crystalline glazes. Yeah, I don't know too much about that because the glazes I use are fairly stable and predictable. Loading your glaze kiln is very similar to loading your bisque kiln with one major difference. And that is that the pots cannot touch each other, nor can they touch the walls of the kiln. So as you know, when the glaze reaches a certain temperature, it actually liquefies. And that means it's going to stick to anything that's touching it. This is also why we typically do not glaze the bottoms of our pots because they will stick to the shelf that they're sitting on. So the idea is that you want to put your pots in the kiln as evenly as possible, but without touching each other. So for a full kiln, the pots can literally be separated by a couple of millimeters, say maybe three millimeters. As long as they're not touching, they're gonna to be just fine. You do need to leave a tiny amount of room for thermal expansion, so the glazes actually do swell up a tiny, tiny bit. However, if your kiln is not super full, you basically just want to create a balanced kiln so you don't get any of these heat pockets. So you want to spread everything out evenly. So before loading a kiln, I like to strategize and try and figure out the best way to fit everything in there and make it you know, balanced. Just like with the bisque firing, you want to alternate high and low shelves so that the air can move around. I think what I'm going to do is I'll put these medium height mugs in first. And on top of that, I'll put a shorter shelf that I can fit some bits and bobs. And then the last shelf will be these tall pieces. And I like to do the tallest stuff on top, partly because then you don't need to like stack the kiln posts. But the main reason is because heat rises. And when you have a less dense area, so you don't have as many kiln shelves, you have a big gap, that creates a cool spot. So it can sort of counterbalance that heat rising and make for, once again, an even temperature throughout your kiln. How many times am I gonna talk about balance? <laughs> So I talked about kiln furniture already in the bisque video, but you do want to make sure that there's kiln wash on all your shelves during the glaze firing, just in case you do have any dripping. So this is my mug height post where my smiley mugs will go. The first shelf is on very short stilts. So I always feel for where those stilts are located and place the new stilts directly on top of those. And then it just ends up being a bit of Tetris. So I'm hoping to fit all of these mugs in here and adjusting them as always to create a balanced kiln as possible, trying to fill any gaps. You can see here that they are very close together, but they're not touching. Of course, they also cannot touch the shelf that's above them. And these ones are right on the edge, so I'm using these little guys to add a couple millimeters of space. These are little stilts that you can buy. They're meant to go underneath pottery, but I like to use them to add a little height as well. Okay, next shelf. So I'm putting my cup here to figure out the middle shelf height. The cup is actually going to go on my final shelf, but I can use this to figure out how tall my middle shelf can be. It's a little too tight for another mug sized shelf. So I'm going to use a shorter stilt on the middle shelf. Once again, you want to make sure that you're placing your stilts directly above the previous. And for this shelf, I've got a couple of random bits. These ones didn't fit into the previous kiln. Maybe you remember these from a previous video of mine. And I've got some samples testing different clay and glaze combos. I always get so excited about the samples. I think they're so fun. As you can see, there's definitely not enough stuff to fill this shelf. And that's fine because I feel like this shelf is a bonus shelf. But what I'll do here is I'll make sure that the items are spaced out evenly to fill the space and then I can go on to the final shelf. This one guy is just a little bit too tall. So I'm going to add the same extra stilt to get a little bit more height and hopefully my cups on top will still fit. Okay, they fit. And I'm using this wooden stick here to make sure that nothing is sticking up too high. Sometimes it's hard to tell by sight alone. And then we just load it up. So I love loading the top shelf most of all because there's so much more space when you don't have the posts in your way. 
And if you're going to be using a cone or a ring, this is when you want to put it in. So for the best reading, you would want to put a ring on the bottom too, or even every shelf of your kiln. But my focus is on the top because that's the part that's typically over firing. So I just drop it in there somewhere in the middle so it can get a reading of the whole top shelf. So that's pretty much it for loading a glaze kiln. So this kiln is going to take about 10 hours to reach its final temperature. I usually check on my kiln periodically throughout the day just to make sure it's on track. So that's it for me today. I hope that this video was helpful for you. Please let me know if you have any questions down in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. Next week, we're going to be moving beyond kilns onto a new topic, TBD. <laughs> so I'll see you then. Bye friends.